See, it's not a question of… Uh, oh, it's just say yes to one of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me right, you got it right, Rabbi. Okay. <laughs> I'm working here. I think that, you know, when I, when I speak to our high school students, I always tell them that the indispensable quality to live a good life is courage. Because what you're describing actually takes a lot of courage. It's not easy to be able to change your ideas. It's not easy to be able to change the pattern of your life, and you have to have a certain amount of courage to allow someone to trample on your ideas because fear is a very powerful motivator in that drive to self-preservation. See, uh, we have given lots of significance to various uh, psychological modes and moods that our intelligence takes. We can call it fear, we can call it courage, we can call it love, we can call it hate. But it is just different shades that your mind takes at different times. All this is only because it is in constant compulsive reaction to something around you. In reaction, if somebody is nice to you, you fall in love with them. If somebody is nasty to you, you hate them. Like this, in reaction, so many things are happening. This is a psychological and social phenomena. This is not an existential reality. Love is not an existential no, reality. No, it is, a, it is what's happening within you, it's your emotion. What is it? Give me an existential reality that doesn't happen within you. Well, life is. <laughs> You're alive right now, this is existential. Well, it's pretty in you though, the huh? life, right? I mean, I don't know, the, the modes of life, the, the, only, the only thing that I have a, 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 a problem with in the way you said it is you said it's just the way your mind. And it seems to me that... <laughs> Let me put it That love way. is a profound reality in people's lives as is thought or learning or all these things that may seem transient but are in fact, I think, deeply rooted in the human experience. Let me come to that. See, it's like this. If your body becomes pleasant, we call this health. You want it? Yes. Hello? Yes. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it pleasure. You want it? <laughs> I got a bigger yes for that than health <laughs> If your mind becomes pleasant, we call this peace. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it joy. If your emotions become pleasant, we call it love. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it compassion. If your very life energies become pleasant, we call this blissfulness. If it becomes very pleasant, we call it ecstasy. If your surroundings become pleasant, we call this success. Only for success, only to make the surroundings pleasant, there is a challenge because you need the cooperation of all the forces which are here. But to make my body pleasant, mind pleasant, emotion pleasant and energies pleasant is one hundred percent my business. But right now, what is entirely your business, you're trying to handle it like a social phenomena. So it looks so complicated and all the problems associated with it. But actually, you being peaceful, you being loving, you being joyful, every human experience happens from within you. Whether it happens with external stimuli or its own self-start, this is the question. What I'm asking you is, you remember, maybe you don't, you're still a young man. <laughs> See, that was pleasant <laughs> <laughs> So, if you had a car in 1950s, uh, you would park it on the slope and in the morning you need two people to push the car. Later on in 60s, crank start, you know, you need one more person to help you. Today everything is self-start, you have a remote which starts your car these days. Now you're driving a car which doesn't even start, <laughs> it just goes <laughs> So, it's just upgradation of technology. So I'm saying, would you like 
your peacefulness, your joyfulness, your love, your blissfulness, your ecstasy be on self-start or push-start. This is something you have to make up your mind on. So, I'm, I'm going to summarize back to you and you tell me if I understood what I heard. You're trying to return people's almost ownership of their own states of being to inside themselves rather than assume that they have to come from the outside or rely on the outside for them to feel the way they feel. This is part one, is that correct? I would just change one word in that question. It's not a state of being. Me being peaceful is not my state of being. Me being loving is not my state of being. Me being joyful is not made of my state of being. It's just my thought and emotion playing pleasantly. Okay. It's like today, the weather is great. Similarly, my inner climate is doing great right now. This is not a state of being, we must understand this. This being word is being used everywhere as if it's a quantity. People say this being, that being. Being is not some kind of a quantity, it's like I'm speaking. This is an activity, this is in motion. Only if I speak, there is speaking. Only if I walk, there is walking. Only if I be, there is being. Well, you be. Huh? You be, though, <laughs> right? I can… and… and so I'm not… I, I, I'm not fully persuaded yet by that distinction, but nonetheless, what is interesting in part is that you… you do actually spend an enormous amount of time and energy, though, trying to make the external world more pleasant for people. The best example is the River Project, which is a remarkable accomplishment and, and enormously ambitious and all about making the external world better. So just ensuring that uh, tomorrow our children have water to drink, is it very ambitious? It is today. I mean, you wouldn't think so, but it, well, let me, the, <laughs> no, no, scale, the scale of work that it That is there. Is. There is a scale because there is a scale of disaster <laughs> unleashed yes. by people. But otherwise, to look at it simply, ensuring that there is water for your children to drink, is it very ambitious or is it very natural? People have become so unnatural that they don't care tomorrow's generation whether they have water to drink or not. So, I think it's very natural, it's very human for you to respond to these things. But the essence of work is not in that. These are unfortunate needs of our times in which we exist. If I was here hundred years ago, I wouldn't be talking about rivers for sure. <laughs> so rivers are not my project. Unfortunately, I see a disaster unfolding, so something has to be done about it. Uh, when I just stepped out, this is a thirty-day journey where I drove nine thousand three hundred kilometers personally myself and we had hundred and forty-two events in these thirty days and one hundred and eighty-two media interviews and uh, hundred and sixty-two million people responded. The largest ever movement on the planet, 162 million people responded to this and we changed the policy. The government policy towards rivers has been changed in India because of this rally for rivers. Yeah, I think that deserves… <laughs> yes. No, it's okay. But the important thing is this, why that many people responded? People were asking me, Sudhguru, you got the whole nation together, all the opposition parties, all political rivals, everybody came together for this one thing. I said, see, when I look at it, everybody knew this needs to happen. But they need a fool to bell the cat. They found me <laughs> How is your message, your… your essential message about life, and how to change your life and how to improve your life different in different places? Do you go to Beverly Hills and see a different need than you see 
in a tribal village in India <laughs> No, not at all. They would like to think they are different, but they are not. They just complicate simple things. If I go to a tribal village, directly those ladies will just come and tell me what's their problem. If I travel to Beverly Hills, they go round and round and round, take three days to tell me what's the problem <laughs> Welcome to my hood, Sadhguru. <laughs> um, and, and how do you… Because, because I think that this is actually something that, that all of us do struggle with, this compulsiveness, this inability to let go of things that we know on some level we should be able to let go of. How do you advise us or help us to let go of those things that we know are almost haunting us sometimes? So let us understand the fundamentals of compulsiveness, where it comes from. See, everything that's physical in this universe, from a single atom to the cosmic, nature of things. Everything that's physical is naturally in cyclical motion. In atom, so things going around, in the cosmos it's going around, solar system is going around, our own bodies are cycles, we are born out of the cycles of our mother's bodies. So, the moment you're identified with the physicality of who you are, you're cyclical in nature. What is cyclical is compulsive. What is cyclical has taken a compulsive pattern. It has to do the same things again and again. You try as hard as you want, it will not go. You will give up one and hang on to another. I hope with a Jewish rabbi a joke is allowed. <laughs> <laughs> a Jewish rabbi actually a joke is mandatory. Yes, so. okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> this happened. It once happened that Sankaran Pillai was uh, working in an office and his office colleague asked for a lift, a woman, a young woman. So he took her in the car and he was driving and suddenly he became like an octopus, that his limbs were all over her. So she pushed him away and said, you fool, I thought you were a decent fellow, what are you trying to do? He said, I'm sorry, I gave up smoking <laughs> So, <laughs> if you try to beat compulsiveness with force, you will switch from one cycle to another cycle, another cycle to another cycle, it keeps happening. Fundamental thing is this, you are so strongly identified with your own physical nature, inevitably you will be cyclical, do whatever you want. So this is why what spiritual means is that your experience of life becomes… something within you becomes larger than your physicality. Physicality includes your thought and emotion. This is… Yes, no, I mean you're… I, what I was going to say, two things. First of all, I think when people talk about whether they're religious or not religious, I actually don't believe that's the distinction. The distinction between people are materialists and non-materialists. That is, those who believe that non-material things are real and spiritual realities are real. And the reason that I bring this up in part is because I know that one of the things we had talked about addressing is the question of mysticism. And it seems to me that both our traditions share a belief that the world that you can see and touch and feel is not all there is. And just now, as I understood you, you were appealing to the non-physical parts of ourselves as a sort of antidote to the over-reliance on the physical part of cyclical compulsiveness. See, it's not a question of… Uh, oh, just say yes to one of my <laughs> questions. <laughs> tell me, tell me right, you got it right, Rabbi. Okay. <laughs> I'm working here. Yes, but <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but the thing is uh, <laughs> it's, it's not something that we have to believe in. 
See, none of us were born like this as we are. We came like this, we became like this. This is just accumulation of the food that we've eaten or it's just a piece of the planet. Most people don't get this point till you bury them. Even that in Los Angeles I feel is difficult because I heard they are being buried in a concrete vault. So even in burial, you will still not know that you are part of the earth <laughs> So this is something that you gathered. Anything that you gather, at the most you can claim is yours. You cannot claim it's me. I can say, this glass of water is my water, my glass of water. But if I say this is me, you, knew, you know that I'm a case. <laughs> you know for sure. So if you say this is my body, yes it is right now, till we bury you. But if you say this is me, you are a case. Your only comfort is everybody around you is a case. <laughs> This is how it is in an asylum. The only nutcase is the doctor <laughs> How do you shift that perspective though? How do you learn to see yourself as continuous with everyone and everything? So it's like this. I'm agreeing with that <laughs> We're good, we're good. See, this is my body, that's your body distinctly separate, at least right now, yes. till both of us are buried. Till then, this is my body, that's your body, very clear. This is my mind and that's your mind, very clear. But there is no such thing as my life and your life. There's no such thing. This is like, I'm sure at some stage in your life when you're in school at least, you blew some soap bubbles, huh? So that's my bubble, this is your bubble, poop it goes. There is no such thing as this is my air and this is your air. This is a living cosmos. You captured some, I captured some. How significant a life you become. When I say significance, not uh, how significant you are in the society or in the world. It's not about that. As a life you become significant because you have captured that much of life which overwhelms the puniness of your own mind and physical body. Within you, the life that you've captured is a larger dimension than the body that you've gathered and the information that you've gathered in the form of your mind. When the life that you are is bigger than your mind and your body, no teaching is needed. You're simply conscious about that, that's all. It's not that you believe that, that's a living reality for you. So my whole work is to bring people to a dimension of experience where the life that they are is larger than the mind that they are. Life that they are is larger than the body that they are. So you don't have to give a teaching or a, or a kind of a belief system, naturally what is most dominant becomes you, within you. And the way that you bring people to that dimension of being or dimension of existence is... See, as there is a science and technology for external well-being, there is a whole science and technology for inner well-being. The problem that happens in every tradition is, over a period of time, generation after generation, it gathers moss. So much frill it gathered, Nobody knows where the skirt is. <laughs> there's there's a… Uh, there was a French Catholic writer, Charles Paguay, who said, everything begins in mysticism and ends in politics. <laughs> and I think that in religious traditions, that's exactly… Yes. there's a great deal of truth to that. So how do you scrape the barnacles off the boat or the moss off the tradition and identify that kernel which can actually expand people's sense of what is what they are a part of, but what they are only a small part of. I think uh, I came with a huge advantage that uh, I'm completely uneducated. 
refused to be educated. <laughs> Why I'm saying this is, it is not easy to remain uneducated. Because from the moment you're born, the moment somebody sees a child, all the adults want to pounce upon the child, wanting to teach something that's not worked in their life. Parents, teachers, uh, every kind of people, the moment they see a child, they want to teach the child something. It's very clear, when you look at the child, the exuberance and the joy that the child has and the adults are the way they are, obviously it's not worked for them, <laughs> whatever they know. <laughs> but they want to teach it to the child. <laughs> so I refused this one influence on me, I just remained as I was. Uninfluenced by parents, teachers, society, religion around me, politics around me, I kept myself away from that. If you keep yourself away from identifying yourself with just about anything around you, anything, including your genetics, your society, religion, politics, economics, whatever is happening around you, if you're not identified with anything, it is natural for human intelligence to find its way. Nobody has to teach anybody anything. If you just make sure children don't get identified with you, hello? <laughs> that you don't want that, you want them identified with you. Because uh, it's your legacy, it's not a new life, it's your legacy. You want to live after you're dead. You want them to be just like you in so many different ways. If you don't have this problem, if you leave them alone, just nurture them so that they're not influenced by anything, you will see the world will be full of mystics. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> persuaded. <laughs> First of all, okay, there, there are three things that you said that I'm not completely persuaded of. One is that you never learned anything. Um, the, when you say you're uneducated, you spoke a language, you knew your neighborhood that you lived in, you learned how to eat and what foods to make, you learned lots of things from the people around you. There's no way you could have survived had you not learned. That's one. Wait, I'm not done. <laughs> number two, number two, I want you to know that when I had a child, I didn't want to teach her the ways that I was that didn't work for me. I rather wanted to teach her the joy that I found in the world and the beauty. And I teach her poetry and I teach her wonder and I think a lot of what I teach her expands her life. I'm sure I've taught her some things that she would say, gee, I wish you hadn't taught me that. <laughs> but, but I really do believe that most parents want to teach their children not the things that didn't work for them, but rather the things that they found in the world that are extraordinary and wonderful. No, I, I did not mean didn't work in that sense. See, the only thing about the adults or the parents is, the only qualification you have is you landed here a few years earlier, yes. all right? <laughs> Nothing else. Hello? Yes. Isn't that so? Yes. You just came here a little early. So what do you know? You know a few survival tricks that the child does not know. If you want to teach them business, you want to teach them how to survive in the world, fine, you know better than them, of course. But as life, the reason why everybody loves a child is because child is a better life than the adult <laughs> in every way. Just as life, maybe he doesn't have your intellect, maybe he's not accumulated the nonsense that you've accumulated, Maybe he does not know how to survive in the world, but as a life, he is far more exuberant and alive than you are. That is why it doesn't matter whose child, when you see a child, you light up, because it's life. Even… even the grave-faced people get ignited <laughs> all right? You know <laughs> So, when I say teaching children something that did not work in their life, it is not that your survival tricks did not work, obviously they worked for you, that's what you want to teach because you're concerned about the child's survival, all right? You're concerned what will happen to him, what will… this is the only thing. See, when people have children, they only have moments of joy, rest of the time it's only anxiety, what will happen, what will happen, what will happen <laughs> Yes, because it's all about survival. So if you even, I mean I'm uh, trying to uh, look at this comprehensively, 
Even if you... if you just examine the prayers on the planet, this says everything about the adults. Ninety-five percent of the prayers on the planet are just about, Dear God, give me this, give me that, save me, protect me. Does it sound like survival or divine expansion? Maybe only five percent is there. Ninety-five percent is only save me, protect me, give me this, give me that, isn't it? This is all survival process, outsourced. Well, you, I must... I, I admit that you are the first person that, that I know who preaches um, uh, a desire to uneducate people. Um, and, and I understand what you're saying, that there is a pure life to a baby, but I don't believe that that pure lifedness can exist in an adult the same way it does in a child. I said the same way that it does in a child. No, look, you're a man, in all seriousness, you're a man who has political savvy, you've written books, you travel and speak. There's a certain, there is a certain sophistication to your lack of sophistication that I think is quite right. <laughs> that is, that is, seems to be pretty clear. I'm not, I'm not suggesting, oh, you're just like everybody else. But, but I also think that maybe you are overplaying the extent to which um, no, let civilization, me I, I civilization is saying. a bad idea. No, no. I think it's a, usually a pretty good idea, often. No. Civilization is organization of human, basic human intent, just an organized structure. But organization can also get suffocating for the growth no question. of an individual life. Yes. When you are five years of age, let's say, when all of you were five years of age, how joyful, exuberant and alive you were, and how you are today, though for all of you I can see life has worked out very well, better than you would have imagined for many of you. In spite of that, compared to how you were five years of age and today how you are, has it gone down or not? See, I want you to understand, with age, only physical agility can go down. Aliveness need not go down. Hello? So are you trying to die in installments? That's all I'm asking you. <laughs> it seemed foolish to do it all at once, so I thought, <laughs> I, thought I would do it gradually <laughs> over time. But, but what I would say is, also I'm not sure that I would privilege aliveness over everything else because I might be less alive than I was when I was five years old. But I wouldn't go back to being five because I have so much now that I did not have as a five-year-old and some of it, like sad memories, ways in which I've hurt other people, ways in which I've hurt myself, some of it is stuff that may diminish my life but I also think has made me wiser, broader, more empathetic, more sympathetic, deeper, all of those things. So, I don't see this as a one-way street. See, essentially, you are trying to, uh, what to say, prescribe some amount of suffering for everybody so that they become wiser. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying that it's... I'm saying that a certain amount of suffering is inevitable and once it happens to you, I'm not sure you wouldn't choose it. But I'm not sure that once it happens, when you look back on it, you would say, it didn't actually allow me in some ways to deepen myself. I don't think that that's unfamiliar to your religious tradition. It certainly isn't to mine. No, I was just about to clarify that. When I said I came with an advantage, I did not belong to any tradition as such. I did not identify with any tradition, nor they could put me into any tradition, this is all I did, I did not identify myself with anything. Just to tell you to what extent, I was uh, around maybe twelve, twelve years of age and uh, you know in India, our mothers and parents generally, they're not given to everyday profess I love you, this and that, there is no verbal expression of love. They live for us, we know the question of whether they love us or not doesn't arise because their lives are about us. 
So, it never occurs whether they love us, don't love us, such things don't even exist. It is just their lives are dedicated to us, so we know they live for us. So, when I'm around twelve years of age, some tender moment and uh, not exactly I love you, but in some way she expressed her affections towards me. I'm in that mode at that time, struggling, you know, that I... I've made sure that I don't belong anywhere, but at the same time I'm extremely involved with everything. So I just asked... I, it was a natural question for me. I asked her, suppose I was born in the next house, would you still feel this way about me? She just teared up. I didn't know what I said wrong, I thought I just asked a question. But it... somehow she just teared up and went away. And after ten minutes she came back and she did something very strange. She came and touched my feet and she was all in tears. I didn't know what to say, I said, what did I do wrong? I just asked a question <laughs> But when I look back later on when things changed within myself, I saw that she saw the point, she got it in such a profound way because it is true that her affections are simply because I am her son, not as a life, not as a... just another being. If I was somebody else, she wouldn't feel the same way. When she realized that, she just kind of, you know, an expansion is also cracking up, you know <laughs> The eggshell has to crack for something new to come out. So, I just kept... See, if your intelligence is not aligned or associated or identified with anything, it is natural for human intelligence to seek relentlessly. Seeking relentlessly means without any purpose. See, the difference between... because you mentioned the word mysticism, the difference between mysticism and other ways of doing things is, everybody is trying to find something, a scientist trying, is trying to find something, uh, everybody, somebody who is walking the street right now is trying to find something of their own needs. Every human being, every animal is trying to find something, maybe food, maybe shelter, maybe whatever. So if you have a torchlight, if you have a... what do you call this? Flashlight. flashlight. If you have a flashlight, you have focused light, you're trying to find something. You only see this person or this person or this person. What mysticism means is, you blew your flashlight, it became a flare. You saw everything the way it is. And after that, you're never the same again.